Hello and welcome to Critical Praxis week number eight. I don't believe it's already been uh, eight weeks here. Uh, this week's topic is set by Jared Bishop in discussion with me. Uh, if all is planned well, hopefully we will be able to see Jared's face tomorrow on Critical Praxis. The topic is please talk about resistance in the classroom. Specifically, how does power play itself out through bodies and discourses as a means of ensuring its own central position? For instance, the privileged body that refuses to mark their privilege by refusal to engage and or effective responses that keep their body at the center of the discussion, uh, example being uh, crying because of one's own guilt. How does this manifest in everyday performances as a person leading a critical life? Take the topic how you'd like. Now there's a number of ways that I could approach this topic and I want to specifically talk about, I was going through my uh, some old issues of uh, Radical Teacher, a journal that I highly recommend. And I wanna talk about this from the perspective of, uh, or even maybe the politics of being out in the classroom and or being queer or performing queerness in the classroom, as well as in everyday life. Now uh, for me as an instructor, and yes, there's ongoing politics and embedded privilege with me being a person that's out, feels the ability to be out of the closet, who's able to do so in the classroom space itself. So I don't want to in one way privilege that this is the way to be. I want to recognize that this is the ability that I have and the privilege I have of being able to be out in a classroom and still feeling secure about doing so. So this is not meant to be some sort of privilege whatsoever. As a marked queer body in the classroom, and queer here is uh, not just about non-heterosexual uh, sexual identity, but also about queer gender being that trans and gender queerness that I also embody at the same time, that every single time that I come up with an example of queerness in the classroom, it gets attributed to these identity markers that are I'm already known by. That the only reason that I might talk about queerness is because, well, I'm queer. Uh, whereas when I talk about things like race in the classroom, it gets dismissed as something still out there and distant as a more legitimate example, despite the fact that I am mixed race and also out about that as well. And so I think part of the reason is because I do pass as white, because I also have white privilege, is that when I talk about race, the my my racialized body the component of my body that's also in, implicated within critical race theory or discussions about non-whiteness gets you race as though i'm I, i'm now doing the white the white liberal thing and the right white liberal thing which is to in a, in a classroom talk about race and multiculturalism and holding hands and working through tolerance so that we can work together collectively that that's what you're supposed to do as opposed to i'm also politically implicated motivated i feel the need and necessity to engage race as an important key component of how we engage the world just as i do queerness However, because my queer identity, my queerness, my paint and nails, what have you, are attributed in very uh, unique ways that all of a sudden queerness becomes the, the constitutive uh, motivation for why I would talk about queer things, as opposed to we talk about these things because they have real world implications beyond the queer body. Right, and that's the key component here. And so I wanna to turn to the example that uh, it, it feels like it's getting a little dated at this point, but it's still very interesting, very necessary, and very important. And that's the idea of students using the term that's gay in the classroom setting, as well as outside of the classroom setting in everyday life. So whenever I hear that's gay, my typical response first off is to assess the situation really and really to make sure that I'm safe, right? Not that I necessarily have power, but in some way I guess it's also that I have the, the authoritative position relative to the situation to to feel safe to engage this dialogue, right? And so what I mean by that is when I hear it, for instance, in a classroom, my typical response is to, in my very typical funny way, I think lighthearted way, approach those students and ask them just very straight up, where? And then when they say, what do you mean where? Then I say, well, you said that's gay, as in there are two people of the same sex or, or more of the same sex having sex somewhere. And I'm wondering where, I would like to see this. Uh, at which point the students usually awkwardly laugh and then slowly they come to realize that their words have a different dynamic than what they were uh, expecting perhaps, right? And we can offer the dialogue. That after all the laughing has subsided and we can really kind of get to some of the critical dialogue here, I think part of the working, working with resistance is trying to uh, help the students and work with people to understand that charges of homophobia, racism, sexism, ableism, what have you, are not the body themselves. And I think that this is where I see a, a common trap happening here. And what I what I mean by this is that when I'm working with a student, for instance, and let's stick with this example of the That's Gay in Classroom 
coming from a person who's queer, right? That it, this is a, a an outed uh, heterosexual person in the classroom who says that's gay, and I approach them, we have this dialogue, we laugh, ha ha, where's the gay person having sex? And then we realize, oh, it's actually problematic language, and that that's gay or gay is not a synonym for something bad. We can start talking about how that is, it's a word choice that is informed by homophobia. That the notion that someone is homophobic uh, to me is wrong. That I don't know that people are necessarily homophobic, but that they deploy homophobic uh, remarks, homophobic ideology. I have yet to be convinced that a person can be called something and be that thing, homophobic, racist, what have you, as opposed to they draw on racist tools from systems that are informed by homophobia. So we are in a white supremacist, uh, supremacist culture. We are in a heterosexist and homophobic culture. We are in a patriarchy, a heteropatriarchy, which means that people become and are informed by these systems that tell you and give you the tools and tell you that you have relative positions of power to use these tools of homophobia, sexism, racism, uh, racism, ableism, what have you, without question. Interventions into these systems is potentially dangerous in one way because when I say, for instance, don't say that language, that's homophobic language, this is what it's doing in terms of reifying this, this structure where you're fitting into this and that only your straight body can get away with this. It's important to separate the person from the system so that they understand the system is informing them and that they are then in turn buttressing that system by perpetuating the, these practices. Now the form of resistance that comes in is typically the person in some relative position of power, the straight body. Body, the white body, the able body, the man, what have you. That, 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 that the scripted response, the privilege, is being able to say, shut up, you're being too sensitive, quit being PC, yada, yada, yada. Also read as, I refuse to acknowledge my privilege. I refuse to acknowledge my words hurt you. I refuse to acknowledge that I'm homophobic, racist, sexist, ableist, what have you. Uh, and this is the resistance that we're working with as instructors, as critical thinkers, as people trying to engage the world progressively, working towards some form of radical coalition building. Because frankly, with, it's within even marginalized communities that we already know have been tracked through for a long time now that these problems persist even in these spaces. So I think working against resistance for me, first deals with and inherently needs and, 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 and demands that we help the individual understand, and I hate help because it sounds like so colonial, but work with people to understand at least this idea that they're informed by a system and that they're informing the system at the same time in this, this cycle, this, this, this very tight cycle of ongoing or perpetuating hate, essentially, is the best way to put it. One final point that I want to make about the that's gay example or uh, other similar examples is that I am not a fan of and I do not believe in censoring students uh, or, or anybody's really their words based on the pure fact that, that we don't say these things, that we just say that's off limits. I don't believe in that. I am a firm believer in the transformative potential of communication, and I believe that transformation only happens and only emerges through critical dialogue, like what it is that we are trying to work with on this channel here. And I think that uh, while I jest and I ask a student, well, where's the gayness happening in the classroom? It, it, it serves as a point to start and open that dialogue with those students so that I can start trying to understand the deeply contextual and historical reasons that brought those words to this student in this moment. And I think that's very key to really trying to work against and with the resistance that might happen. Frankly, no one wants to be called homophobic or racist. Maybe you do, I don't know. And I think really trying to contextualize and work with people to understand how it is that certain words and communicative choices can come off as and are in fact uh, homophobic or racist or ageist or what have you, I think allows someone to really understand the deeply and rich dynamic that is communication, that these choices are never politically empty, that they are never void, that they are full and that they are intentional and that they have an effect and an affect on people's lives every single day. And so for me, working against that resistance comes in the key of let's have a dialogue. Let's have a critical discussion about what it is that you're saying and the impact of that dialogue. And this means as a, as, as, as a pedagogue, as someone who teaches, that when these moments happen, I have to pause the class and we need to open these discussions and we need to sit in it until we really understand what is going on in these spaces to really be dedicated to changing that communication in a way that's not just censoring, but in a way that says, I chose to not use these words because in choosing the words I used to use, I now see are problematic, that they hurt, that they are acts of violence against other people. And so this is 
one of the things and one of the ways that I really truly try to always approach critical dialogue and resistance in the classroom. Another form of resistance that comes in, uh, at least in my experience, is again this notion that I'm a queer body and so for some reason I only use queer examples because I'm a queer body, like as though uh, I have no other bank to draw upon whatsoever. This form of resistance I think is, is productively met in my experience by turning the table and helping people to see that when we don't talk about things like queerness, we are also talking about something else. And so for me to say uh, that queer couple is, 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 as a queer person, someone would say, of course you're gonna use that example. But if I were to say that couple or that heterosexual couple that got married the other day, the question doesn't come in to call when it's a straight instructor using those examples, right? When we make a certain communicative choice, like a queer example or a race-based example, and that can be anything across the board, we're at the same time choosing not to say all of this stuff over here. So the political choice to draw on queer examples, on non-white examples, or even critical whiteness uh, on, on, on women, putting women at the center of discussion, putting ability at this discussion, at the center of the discussion, is important to dislodging the assumption that everything has to default to what Audre Lorde would call the mythic norm, uh, this 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 mythic entity that we all strive for, this 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 idea that there's some sort of common sense uh, embodiment that we strive for, and in fact we do that no one can actually access. Yet it's something we are measuring ourselves up against, and that mythic norm being uh, white and upper middle class and and male and able bodied, right, and heterosexual and Christian. These are the base norm, that this, this notion of a mythic norm that no one body ever is always, all the time, all of these things, but this, this, this measure that we, that we work towards. So this means that people who are not queer should start, in my opinion, drawing on queer examples to challenge themselves and ask yourself, why are you not talking about queerness? Why is the white instructor avoiding discussions about race? Why is the cognitive normal person not critically interrogating uh, neurotypicality? Why is the able-bodied person not talking about disability and why the elevator is out of order in a building on the third floor in a classroom and your student has a wheelchair and can't get to class and you still blame them for being absent? These are critical questions that I think as pedagogues we also need to continue to interrogate ourselves about what are we also not talking about and this is a challenge for me to constantly ask myself what am I choosing not to talk about so that I can talk about what I do this is the give and take of dialogue which means it should never end these should these should promise and beg for constant discussions in and out of the classroom I'm gonna leave the discussion here I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing what others have to offer uh, in this discussion until next week peace to you all